Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's a beautiful Sabbath day. Spring is coming. And that's a good sign. All right. Well, first of all, I want to welcome you to the Waterford Seventh-day Adventist Church. Those of you who are checking in online to watch us, we're so glad that you came to our site here to worship God together with us. I also want to invite those, uh, anybody who wants to stay for potluck, we have a meal after the worship service, a great opportunity to get to know one another and some fantastic food. And so I hope you can uh, join us for that. But I've got a special message. Um, when we were up to our ministerial meetings up to uh, Camp Asabo in January, uh, do any of you know a gentleman by the name of Stephen Boer? Okay, some of you. He, he's, he's well known in our church and um, does a lot of presentations. And he wrote a 120-some page paper on Daniel and on Revelation. And he was sharing bits and pieces of that with us. And I can't believe what I learned from him on this paper. And so I'm going to share a little bit ab about that with you this morning. And I'm going to have some more sermons down the road that will elaborate a little deeper about Revelation chapter 10, which is a significant chapter for our denomination. And it's amazing how accurate the Bible really is. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Gracious Father, I want to thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day, for all these smiling faces here today, Lord. It's just awesome to see everyone. Be with those who could not make it today, but Father, we're glad that there's people online who are also watching your message. And most importantly, Father, you will be glorified. It is you that we want to see glorified more than anybody or anything else. And all this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And I've shown this picture before. This is actually Eagle River where we used to live in um, Alaska. And yeah, I mean, it's amazing when you open up your front door, and not, that's not from our front door, but the beauty is astounding. And we were very blessed to have spent time there. Now, Revelation chapter 11 is where we're going to be predominantly this morning. Revelation chapter 11. And I've talked a little bit about this before, but after reading and studying this paper that Dr. Boer had written, I'm uh, doing some big time modifications and we're gonna be going into a deeper dive in the next several weeks. So hang on to your hats. So what is, what is essential, what is the essential message of the open book? Revelation 10, verse two. He had a little book, which was what? It was what? Open. It was open. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And there's symbolism behind that that I will be sharing down the road. So what does sea or waters represent? In Bible prophecy multitudes many people absolutely and by mentioning here he mentions sea and land Jesus has a message for the whole world and he uses these beautiful books called Daniel Revelation Revelation 10 spotlights events right before the seventh seal which announces the second coming of Jesus. Revelation 10:2 that we just read is in direct correlation to Daniel 12 verse 4. But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a what? A secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end when many will rush here and there and knowledge will increase. So he says in Daniel, seal up the book which also denotes that eventually that book will be reopened. Is the book reopened today? 
Yes, absolutely. And that's significant because we are to know what is God trying to tell us through these beautiful prophecies. It is the gospel story. It reveals the God whose love caused him to come to this earth because he longs for us to be with him in heaven. So even though dates and historical events are sometimes useful to understand, don't get bogged down necessarily in the details. If you forget everything else, remember this much. God loves you, and he has set a date and a time when he is coming to be with you. And knowing the God that we serve, he will be here on time. And he's excited about this great rendezvous that he's going to be making with us. His prophecies are really love poems that say ex excitedly, be dressed and be ready when I come. You don't know the day or hour, but you'll know when it is close. Those awesome Millerites back in the 1800s have learned, they learned the hard way, but they learned that you cannot set the date, exact date, and time when Jesus will return. But they did have the exact date and time for the ending of the 2300-day prophecy, which became the 2300-year prophecy. And that did end in 1844. And that is significant. We're not going to talk too much about that today, but we will shortly. If you are, going, if you are currently going through a difficult personal experience, remember that Jesus is waiting expectantly for you to reach out and accept his free offer of salvation and assistance. Now let's go to Revelation 11, 1 through 6. And I'm going to ask Brother Evan, if he would be so kind, to read Revelation 11, 1 through 6. I know we got mics around here somewhere. Revelation 11, 1 through 6. Maybe. Here we go. Nice and loud. All right, Re Revelation 11, 1 through 6 is what yes. you're looking for? All yes. Right. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have the power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Now, Revelation um, 11 is highly symbolic. Thank you, Evan, as you can tell. Very symbolic. And Revelation 11, 1 through 13 is part of the sixth trumpet, another sermon coming for another Sabbath. So let us start with a summary of key events in these first few verses that we have just read. Verse 1, John takes a reed, which is a tape measure, and he's told to measure how many things? Three. Measure three things. The temple of God, the altar, and the worshipers. The wording here is referencing Revelation 10, verse 11. Yeah, let's see. Revelation 10, verse 11, you're in there somewhere. Here we go. Where it is referring to the remnant who must prophesy again. So it's referring to a group of people who must open the book and prophesy again. The same prophecy, but prophesy again to the whole world. And it has to happen just before Jesus returns. How many here believe that we are in the toe jam of King Nebuchadnezzar's statue or dream? 
We are right there. We are that close, very close. In verse 2 in Revelation 10 or 11, John is not to measure the courtyard outside of the temple, and that is to be given to the Gentiles for 42 months or 1260 days. Now, the court has been regarded as representing this earth in contrast with the temple of God in heaven. And Gentiles very well may mean that those who are not worshipers, who have not confessed themselves as belonging to the Israel of God. After the 42 months correlates to, Dan well, actually, and the 42 months correlates to Daniel 7, verse 25, where it says, time and times and a dividing of time. And then verse 3, power will be given to who? My two witnesses. So power, which is power, is to be given to my two witnesses. So God has two witnesses out there that's going to receive some pretty mighty power. And they will speak for 1,260 days or years and are dressed in clothes that the mourners wear. As evil has it or had it during the Dark Ages at the time of the 1260-year prophecy, the Spirit of God would still bear witness to those who would receive them. And the wearing of sackcloth was a common sign of mourning and of penitence. So the scriptures might be described as being in mourning at a time when human traditions are in the ascendancy. You know, when Charlie and I were in Europe, we toured some pretty huge cathedrals that were built thousands of, thousand, at least a thousand years ago. And it, was, it took a couple different generations just to build them. But a lot of those cathedrals were built from people's money for their indulgences, meaning that they paid to have their sins forgiven. That's how the church at that time managed to get enough money to pay for those unbelievably large cathedrals. Verse 4 identifies the two witnesses as the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God. Verses 5 and 6 show us the power that the two witnesses have wielded and will wield over the earth. And this may all seem a little far-fetched or even a little science fiction or an account of maybe some aliens invading Waterford. But it is actually a very unique description of the power of the Word of God. The two witnesses talking here in the Word of God represents the Bible. And it represents the Old and the New Testament. What better witnesses are there in this world to show the love of God? What better witnesses are there? There are none besides the Old and the New Testament. They're also pictured as lampstands and olive trees, and this is familiar biblical imagery. So let's do a quick dive across the scriptures to figure this out regarding lampstands and oil, and olive trees, not oil, but olive trees. John 5.39 says that Jesus, and Jesus identified the scriptures as, these are they which testify, or you could say witness, of me. Matthew 24, 14 says, Jesus said the gospel would be preached to the world as a what? As a witness to all the nations. And in biblical times, olive oil was used to light the lamps. Psalms 119, 105 states that your God's word is a what? To my feet and a light to my path. And Psalms 119, 130 says the entrance or the understanding of your words give light. So understanding the word of God, the Bible says, gives what? Light. The two witnesses are called olive trees and lamps because the Old and the New Testaments are our main sources of spiritual light. 
The point then of verses 1 through 6 is that the message of the Bible is the standard or the measuring instrument for determining who belongs to Jesus and unfortunately, who belongs to Satan. The investigative process is what began in heaven in 1844. Another study that we will be going through. Jesus will come when that process is complete, when it is openly and fairly determined whose side everyone is on. We will either be on Christ's side or Satan's side. There will be no middle ground. There will only be two sides. John relies, or relays, I should say, a special word of caution. In fact, in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, he says that if anyone adds or detracts from the book of Revelation, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. God wants to safeguard his message. He's very protective of what his two messages or his two witnesses portray. Because his witnessing and his witnesses lead people to salvation. Amen? Amen. And those who deliberately oppose or distort God's truths sent to the world by Jesus who died that we might live forfeit that special relationship between God and his followers. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 11. You still got the mic there, Evan? You did that so well that I want you to do it again. Revelation 11, verses 7 through 10. Revelation 11, verses 7 through 10. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, <clears throat> where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Sounds good. Thank you. Did that real, real well. This is a description of Satan's vigorous attempt to destroy the Bible. You've heard it right. He wants this Bible destroyed. From a previous study that we learned regarding the 1260-year prophecy, which extends from A.D. 538 to A.D. 1798, during this time period, those who are not God's people will oppress Christians and attempt to suppress the Word of God. They tried to burn the, the Word. They tried to burn the Bible and only allowed certain people to even have access to the Bible to even interpret it in languages that they did not understand. During the closing years of this prophetic period, the French Revolution actually launched an all-out assault on the Bible truths for three and a half years. Princeton, a Princeton University professor by the name of Palmer, refers to this time as an earthquake in his book, The Age of the Democratic Revolution. And that is exactly what John pictured in Revelation 11, verse 13, a severe earthquake. The French Revolution was noted for its opposition to Christianity and its war on the Bible. And during the reign of terror, as many as 50 people a day were decapitated by the guillotine. References to Sodom and Gomorrah and Egypt in Revelation 11 represent spiritual decay. Sodom was destroyed because of its moral degradation and defiance against God. The Egyptians challenged God directly with their own idols and were destroyed by the plagues. Likewise, the anti-Christian stance of the French Revolution was an attempt to do away with God's authority. So in summary... God's word was trampled on by men. But there is hope. There is light at the dark end of the tunnel. All right. 
heaven. You are doing so good. Just for that, we'll feed you at potluck today. Appreciate that. Revelation 11, verses 11 through 14. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Okay. Thank you for that. But now we come to a great time of triumph. Now we come to the time when God's team wins. Verse 11. Let's dissect this just a little bit. The key words here are breath or life. Hebrews equated breath with life. Verse 12. What command was given by the voice from heaven? Come up here. In verse 13, a great earthquake occurs and one-tenth of the city is destroyed. 7,000 men are killed. What did the rest of the people do? They gave glory to God. How many here like to give glory to God? You already have by being in this sanctuary today, this particular morning, on this holy day of the week. By coming here, you have given glory to God. These verses described what followed the final three and a half years of the French Revolution. Its grisly rule of the guillotine and the suppression of the Bible. Christianity awakened to a great revival. William Miller a Baptist preacher, led out in one of the world's greatest revival, a revival that birthed the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Bible truths were rediscovered and championed as never before. And in the end, some of the greatest skeptics had the acknowledgement of the power of God. The French Revolution slid down into the very earthquake it had caused, while the Bible reclaimed its place of honor in the hearts of people around the world. Listen to this. There are some key events into the awakening of the faith. In England, John Wesley and George Whitfield sparked a great evangelical revival. Some of these foreign missions I'm going to talk about here just for a second, and I showed these before, are entered a new era. Henry Martin, actually, Henry Martin, a 25-year-old Cambridge graduate, arrived in India as a missionary in 1806. Henry proclaimed, let me burn out for God. And his same spirit was seen in Judson of Burma, Carey of India, Morrison of China, Mofay and David Livingstone of Africa. Their witness energized thousands of Christians worldwide. And as boys and girls knelt beside their beds at night, they promised God that they would follow him at any cost. And follow him they did. Bible societies exploded onto the scene. Around 1800, Joseph Hughes, a Baptist layman, felt impressed by God to provide Bibles inexpensively for the people of Wales. As his vision for Bible uh, distribution intensified, he asked, why not the world? In 1804, a few years after the French Revolution had peaked, Hughes and others founded the British and Foreign Bible Society. In 1816, similarly, dedicated believers created the American Bible Society. And these societies have made tremendous impact in the distribution of the Word of God. We're talking millions of Bibles being distributed. The Bible can never be defeated. Never be defeated. Yes, God makes sure that His Word lives and abides forever. He invests it with his own unconquerable life. Powerful human leaders may seem more alive than any printed book, but after they become statues, the Bible still comes to life in human hearts everywhere. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God stands for how long? Forever! 
ever. Isaiah 40, verse 7 and 8. Now listen to this. I think I've shared this one before. American revolutionary Thomas Paine once said, I sincerely detest the Old Testament. Well, guess what? Thomas Paine is dead. But the Bible that he detested is still creating spiritual revolutions. The skeptic Voltaire used his considerable wit and intellect to attack the superstitions of the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus. Well, guess what? Voltaire is dead. But millions of Christians are still celebrating the birth of Christ and his resurrection. Jesus said, The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. The words of the Bible not only have life, they are able to give life. Like a buried seed germinating into a blossoming plant, the word of God in our hearts blossoms into a whole new way of living. Peter described it as having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. And how long is forever? It's forever. It's forever. The letters of Jacob, a candle maker, candle maker, sent from the town of Bruges to his wife in 1569, are remarkable for their cheer and tenderness. He reminds his affectionately, affectionately beloved and chosen wife of God's promise. He who touches you touches the apple of his eye. And he speaks of the time when God will wipe away every tear and about the wonderful things that God prepared for those who love his appearing. Jacob's letters are full of encouraging words from the scriptures. And what makes these letters even more remarkable is that they were penned in prison by a man who was about to be burned at the stake for, uh, for being a heretic. Jacob had decided to take a stand on the word of God against certain religious traditions. And during the long hours of, of interrogation, he was threatened and told to submit his wisdom to his superiors. Jacob replied, I do not rely upon my own wisdom, but I rely upon the words of Christ. Does lone candle maker manage to resist the enormous pressure of church authority because he remains satisfied with the simple holy scriptures? And that powerful word of God enabled him to keep on sending out letters of encouragement to the very end when he died in the flames with intrepid spirit. Are you standing on the word of God today? People all, all over the world are polarizing. They're taking sides. Some choose Satan's way of force and intimidation. Others remain faithful to Christ's gospel of love and grace. We are living on the brink of the kingdom of God. We are living between the sixth and the seventh trumpets. We need an unshakable place to stand. And we need to build our lives on the life-giving word of God. We need to take a stand with Jacob, the candle maker, and lift up our light in this dark world. What kind of commitment would you like to make to God right now? What is your commitment to God right now? Would you like to make a new commitment to God? Or re-energize that commitment to God? You can do that right now. All you got to do is ask him and say, Lord, take me. I submit. I submit myself to you. I want to help the Waterford Seventh-day Adventist Church to get the word out and to have people have that same opportunity. I know all of us here probably heard about Michigan State, the, um, another mass shooting that took place this past week. And I don't know where we're at right now, but, yet, uh, but when that took place, 
It was the 67th mass shooting this year. 67. And we're not even out of February yet. There are families who are mourning the loss of their, their young child, that they've invested a lot of money and time into the university and realize that money means nothing when you lose somebody. And I got to thinking when I was watching the news this week on Michigan State and, and, and all that, um, I'm always interested on the psychology of it all. When I was growing up as a kid, you never heard of, of uh, mass shootings in schools or that you have to hunker down. The only time we had to hunker down was to practice a tornado drill. That was it. Ours, we had to go to the bathroom because the bathrooms had no windows. I remember having to sit down on the floor, on the bathroom floor, and uh, put your head between your knees. That was it. That was hunkering down back then. That's the only hunkering down we had to do, but not today. No, they are, kids are schooled into, um, when, when there were three words they used, something, something, fight. Run, what was it? Run, hide, and fight. And I thought that was interesting when they used the word fight. Run, hide, and fight. And it, went, it was executed very well. The students did a very good job. But can you imagine the horror that's two incidences that we know that were close to this church. Oxford and now Michigan State. It's a commonplace is what I'm trying to say. It's, it's a common thing today. And as much as I would like to sit here and say it's going to get better, I'm, I'm afraid the Bible speaks a little differently about that. So that tells me that time is short. That Jesus is soon to come. And we've got the most beautiful message that has never, ever been put out by human hands and will never be put out by human hands. And that message is the salvation of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So let's continue with studying the Word of God. Let's continue with giving other people of your own personal influence an opportunity to study the Word of God. We've got Bible studies from one end to the other in this church. we got plenty of... This church is well-equipped to give Bible studies and to help people along that path. Let's help people along that path. That's what we're all here and about. Unfortunately, we're going to hear more Michigan State kind of scenarios, but it just tells me, just a student of the Bible, that better days are coming. Amen? If you are interested and want to know more about this Jesus that I speak about and want to know more about our wonderful, sa our wonderful Savior, please see any one of our elders or me, and we will be more. You will become our top priority. We will do whatever it takes to help you in your journey to be on the side of Jesus. Because as you saw me present and as I close, there's only going to be two sides. There's not even going to be a middle ground. There's no middle ground. Revelation uh, chapter 3 talks pretty seriously about that. There is no middle ground. It's either Christ or Satan. And we're here for Christ. Amen? And we want all of us to be on Christ's side. Let's pray. Heavenly Gracious Father, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day and for this message that's going to start a series of sermons, Father, on your prophetic word so that we are taught and are ready and to know what's coming down the road and how to share it with other people, how to share some pretty serious stuff with others, but in a very loving way presentation because we want people to be on your side of the camp more than anything lord like you say better days are coming we just got to get through some pretty big humps
But thankfully, Father, we have you to turn to, you to grow to, you to love, because you first loved us. In all this we pray, through Christ our Lord, amen.